Part 1. The director of an engineering company is interviewing an applicant for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Ah, good morning. It's Mr Robinson, isn't it? Have a seat. Stephen Robinson. Yes. Is that S-T-E-V-E-N or P-H? It's V. OK. I've got your letter of application, but I need a few more details for the file. Now, you're from Manchester. What exactly is the address? Uh, yes, it's Dynevor Gardens. That's D-Y-N-E-V-O-R, Presswich. Thanks. And telephone? Oh, well, it isn't mine. It's the landlord's, but I can be contacted. It's 483250. Uh-huh. The landlord lives in, does he? Well, he has the flat downstairs, and he's a friend of the family anyway. I see. OK. According to your letter, I imagine you were born in, uh, let me see, 1960? 61. Right. And the date? 12th of July. Thank you. And I believe you're married. Oh, no, no, I'm getting married, but not for a few months. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, congratulations. Is it going to be in Manchester? Uh, well, no, actually. My fiance is from Wales, so we're getting married in her home village, near Bangor. Oh, how nice. Now, as you know, when you apply for a post with Williams Engineering, we need to find out a few things about both your academic background and more recent work experience, the latter being especially important in respect of this rather specialised position in the area of water management. First of all, A-levels. Yes, I've got three. Geography, maths and physics. Geography, maths and physics. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And what about your degree? I went to Sheffield University and got an engineering degree with water management as my specialisation. Uh -huh. And as for work experience, I started out after graduating in 1986 in China, working for the Chinese government. Did you work as a volunteer? No, I, I did get a nominal salary. It was a two-year irrigation project. That sounds fascinating. How did you organise that? You say it wasn't a British company then? No, no. My university had links with a Chinese engineering university, so it was organised at that level. And after that? Then I came back, moved to Manchester, and have been working with Latimer Engineering since then. And what exactly are you doing for Latimer? Oh, I'm working in irrigation again, this time as a project research assistant. Great. I've got your details. Now let's move on to a more general discussion about what we're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and we could say spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here: Chinese, Indian, and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's, we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on, in the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the student union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the student union, as a student union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here. In fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H Building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon Complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop, and as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines, and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of the buildings here, namely the H Building. Despite its bland name, you might be interested in what goes on there. It is our main recreational centre, with halls, offices, and space available for a variety of activities, mostly for those who want to get fit. For example. If you're interested in yoga, you're in luck, since four days a week there are free yoga classes. They have several levels, so if you're a beginner, you'd have to start with that. You can check the schedules on the wall there. Yoga used to be at night, but now it's in the mornings, but not on Wednesdays. Along those same lines, there's aerobic dancing in the afternoon. This shares the same room as the badminton games, which are on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The aerobics are on the alternate days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's not restricted at all. Everyone is welcome to join, although the instructor may divide you up, of course, according to ability. And just to show how diverse the H building is, there's even some spiritual solace available there. Inside the multi-denominational prayer center, with individual booths and a variety of holy scriptures and texts available to read from all the major religions of the world, that's open all day over the weekend, but not at night time when the rooms are for private booking. Finally, for those of you of a cerebral nature, the University Chess Club operates at night. That's open from eight p.m. Every、uh, is it Wednesday or Monday? No, sorry, Friday, and I think it closes at about eleven thirty p.m. So there's something for everyone in the H building.
That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. 
The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose. There's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the Internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay. And you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure. He gave us them in the lecture. Let's see. You get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about product life cycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm going to begin my lecture today with a look at product life cycles. Now, as we go through the product life cycle, I will be trying to raise some issues which are important with regard to each phase of the cycle. I won't have all the answers for you this morning. This one of the lecture series is just to get you started and, uh, I hope, interested. Let's start with the first phase of the cycle, that of product design. This is really the most important part of the cycle. We often talk as if it is consumers who are responsible for recycling, and so they are, but in reality the major responsibility must be borne by designers. They can design products where recycling is easy and cheap, or difficult and expensive. In the latter case, the likelihood is that recycling, though technically feasible, will not in fact take place. Now, don't jump ahead, because the second stage is not product manufacturing, but rather that of materials acquisition. 
This is the activity we do when we mine coal or other minerals such as gold or iron or copper. In addition to mining, there is harvesting, which includes the cutting down of trees as a first step in the making of furniture or paper, or fishing. These activities have costs which are not only money costs, pollution is one of the extra costs. We have also to think whether the resources we use are renewable, such as trees, or not, such as coal and other minerals. The third stage is not manufacturing either. It is materials processing. This is where we take the raw materials and use energy to change them into a form that can be used in manufacturing. Uh, for example, trees must be turned into paper or oil into plastic. The cotton plants that grow in the fields must be turned into cloth. All of these activities require the use of chemical processes and, as with all chemical processes, waste is produced, often of a dangerous kind. And now we come to the manufacturing stage. This is usually the most expensive in terms of cost and energy and waste. The wastes are often those that contribute to global climate change. For example, we make 41 billion glass containers, mostly bottles, each year, and we throw most of them away. A lot of manufacturing seems unnecessary if we could only organise things better. And this could mean greater profits for the manufacturing companies too. Stage 5 is packaging. Many products are packed in paper or plastic, which themselves, of course, have their own processes and costs. Excessive packaging is often criticised, but it must be remembered that packaging serves a purpose, often more than one purpose, such as maintaining freshness and hygiene, as well as providing information. In our globalised world, we must never forget the next stage, which is distribution. This is the stage where transportation and energy play a big part. Lorries, trucks, trains, planes and ships all use up the precious stocks of oil and, as we know, generate greenhouse gases which, as we hear again and again, contribute to climate change. Stage 7 is the point of it all. Using the product. Looking after products, using them in the recommended ways, timely repair and maintenance all reduce the need for early replacement and reduce the number of products in landfill sites. We should not encourage the purchase of single-use products, that is, products which are designed for use on one occasion only and then to be thrown away and replaced. Um, I'm going to skip a stage for a moment and move straight on to the final stage, which is disposal, putting the product in the bin. This is the end of the life of the product and we lose it completely. It may have only a little value, but it does have a value even at this stage of its life, even in fact when it's actually in the landfill site. Now, I missed out one stage. This is a cycle within a cycle. That is, within the life cycle of the product, there can be a closed loop cycle which can extract more value from the product. This is the reuse and recycle loop. It is a closed loop because, in theory, it can continue forever, though in practice, of course, this is not possible. Recycling products mean that they can be used to make more of the same product. Uh, CDs, bottles, books, or that they can be used to make different ones. For example, one pound of recycled paper can make six cereal boxes. And if we recycled all our newspapers, we could save 40,000 trees a day. Now, with this approach to the life cycle of a product in mind, we can go on to consider life cycle analysis. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.